Okay, so recently savings rates just tipped 5%. There is a question that I hear a lot at the moment. Look, cash rates are rising. Why on earth should I consider investing when I can get nearly 5% on my cash? And do you know what? It's a good question. I mean, many investments in the last year or two have gone down in value. But what if I told you this was not only normal, but that not understanding this dynamic is one of the most expensive mistakes that people make day in and day out. So in this video, I'm gonna be going over the key things that I think you need to be aware of when you are considering the trade-off yourself. I hope it's gonna change the way that you think about it. So wait around till the end to hear this. Anyway, if you've not watched this channel before, my name is George and I'm a Chartered Financial Planner. And my job basically is to make sure that clients fund the life they want and crucially, they never run out of money. So let's talk about why firstly, when cash is at 5%, instead of actually investing, it seems completely reasonable to hold your funds in cash. Well, at first, if you invest in the global stock market, you probably experienced a 10% drop, maybe even 20% last year. Then inflation in most developed countries has been around 10%. And in the UK, there's no sign of stopping. Now it's a bit more complicated when you consider currency and what you're invested in, but we're just gonna park those complexities for now. So actually, when if you imagine you had 100 pounds at the start of 2022, then the investment potentially had a temporary decline of 10% over the year. And then you've also experienced 10% inflation. Actually, compared to the £100 you had at the start, you're 20% or £20 down. 10% investment temporary decline and 10% inflation. I mean, why should anyone invest when that's the case? And this, by the way, is what lots of people are doing. So it's not just you that's thinking this. Reports from the FT showed in 2022 nearly $140 billion of funds had poured into money market funds, according to the Investment Company Institute. And that's effectively a sign of investors moving from putting their money to work in productive investments to money market funds, which are cash or cash-like holdings. So whatever happened to being greedy when others are fearful? If you have a temperament, that when others are fearful, you're going to get scared yourself. You know, you are not going to make a lot of money in securities over time in all probability. But I'm going to be showing you something that I think is going to completely change how you think about this. Okay, so the only return is the real return. One of the biggest things that we all need to be thinking about with our money is the real return. As in, what's the return that you've achieved after you've considered inflation? It's actually not intuitive at all. For example, even if cash is earning 5%, no one thinks when they have that money and the interest lands in their account, actually, if inflation is 10%, I'm 5% down. Or, you know, when someone buys a property like five years ago, they go, oh, I bought it for 400, I saw it, sold it for 430, I made 30 grand. Well, not really, because if inflation over five years has been 10%, you've actually sold it for less in real terms than you bought it. But understanding that the silent killer to wealth is inflation, just to highlight the devastating impact of higher inflation when it's compounded over a very long period of time. If you look at the data from 1900 to 2021, in the US, the annual inflation was 2.9% per year versus 3.6 in the UK. Now, thanks to the power of compounding, this apparently small difference meant that in the US, consumer prices over that time rose by a factor of 33 compared to the UK, which rose by a factor of 73-fold. Now, I appreciate that none of us are living to 120, we don't think, but isn't that shocking? So we have to bear that in mind, the difference between short-term and long-term with our wealth. And if we look back at history, this is from data from JP Morgan, and it shows us the big picture all the way back to 1900. So if you've got one pound at the start of 1900, even after adjusting for inflation, you would have received some interest on your cash, but even after 122 years, you'd only have two pounds in real terms compared to your one at the start. If you had decided to actually put that money to work and invest in the great companies of the world, and you'd been able to stomach the temporary declines, you'd have about 386 pounds after adjusting for inflation, or four pounds in bonds. But this is long-term returns, and look, there's gonna be some volatility because that's the price of admission. The best single thing you could have done on March 11th 1942 when I bought my first stock. Never look at a headline, never think about stocks anymore, just like you would do if you bought a farm. You just buy the farm. The point is, is there's a real trade-off and you have to expect volatility for investing. The way to think about any asset performance is it's sort of the difference between the weather and the climate, and bear with me. And the weather, frankly, can be really variable. Think British summertime. There are some periods where you don't really know whether to bring out an umbrella or your shorts and t-shirt. However, over the long term, it's the climate which drives the overall outcome when you smooth out the day to day. But hold on, you might be thinking, look, if the point of investing is to beat inflation, they certainly haven't done that recently. 
I mean, you know, maybe they won't even do that again. And you know, isn't that just a bit of a con? I mean, putting your money in, expecting growth and not getting it. What if I told you that investments going down when inflation spikes this level is not only typical, but to be expected. And to do that, I have to show you this. This is some of the best data and it comes from a bank with not the best reputation, Credit Suisse, probably gonna be UBS yearbook soon. But don't let that put you off. The data is incredible. It's one of the most comprehensive data sets I've seen on this. And what it shows us is asset returns all the way back to 1900 to 2021 when adjusting for inflation. So the real return, you know, the only one that matters. It's for 21 countries and, and covers a staggering 2,558 cumulative years between them. So effectively, it's one of the most comprehensive bits of market data we have when we're looking through history. And let's just talk about what it shows. You. I want to go over the inflation scale so this makes a bit more sense. So on the left, my right, is deflation. Now that's where inflation is negative. Think 1930s in the US after the Great Depression because prices dropped an average of nearly 7% every year between 1930 and 1933. And this actually happened in a much smaller way during the Great Financial Crisis. Inflation was decreasing, it was deflationary. Now as we move across this scale, inflation starts to get higher, sort of kind of around the 1-4% to range is the sweet spot for most economies. Now if we start to move to the right, the UK last year, and that's sadly, as well from the looks of it, where if we went all the way to the end on this scale, we'd land on the Weimar Republic in pre-Second World War Germany when there was hyperinflation. And look, I know on first glance, this might not look the easiest to read, so let me go over this. In the, now the dots in the square, this is the lower bound of what inflation was. So the second from the left, that's a lower bound of minus 3.5%. That means in that kind of percentile, the inflation or disinflation to be precise was around minus 3.5%. And the next percentile, the lower bound was 0.5. So as we go from left to right, inflation is becoming higher. So, so, so what can we take from this? Well, well, look, if we look closely, when inflation is negative, asset price returns are very good. Of course they are. You know, if deflation is 15% and your asset return is actually minus 5, your real return after adjusting for inflation is 10%. Sounds good. Well, not really. But where the sweet spot for both bonds and equity returns on average is when inflation is kind of in this middle range, when it's somewhere between 0.5 and 4.1. And can you understand now why central bankers around the world like their 2% target for inflation? You know, life is good, at least asset returns typically are, and things are going according to plan. Now, it's in this region that a standard risk premium plays out, which is that equity returns are typically higher than bond returns. The problem is, though, is that basically no developed market ever really wants inflation to be above 6%. And we get to the this side, and inflation is now up to 74 or even up to 18% and above, slightly further forward. Asset prices start to drop a lot. And let's just take a second to think about why that might happen. Well, because if inflation is this high, something's gone wrong. It's, it's not just expected inflation, but in asset prices, it's unexpected inflation. Perhaps it's a supply shock or a war. Whatever the position is, it's highly likely that it wasn't priced into those assets because to do that, everyone would have expected unusually high inflation. So simply put, it's very normal for asset price returns to really struggle when inflation is very high. This is the reason why the base rate, which generally drives up savings rates on cash, goes up. However, if inflation comes down as predicted, savings rates, which is the return you get on cash, will also likely decrease. So this is the big, big thing you need to take from this. If it is the case that inflation comes down as central bankers are expecting, forecast here, here, and here, you know, eventually, eventually, Mr. Bailey, then when that inflation comes down, looking at the historical data, when that happens, on average, it can be a good thing for asset prices. If you look here, you can see that the real returns when inflation drops can often be very good. Obviously, no guarantees, but that's the data. So in hiding in cash, what it boils down to is the same stuff it always boils down to. Can you guess? Market timing. If you try and get the time right on when to hold cash and when to invest, if inflation comes down and the market recovers, you could miss out on any recovery and do the cardinal sin of investing, which is buy high and sell low. So in line with this, I'm gonna leave you with four things to think about courtesy of Vanguard. One, market declines are completely normal and to be expected. 
all of market history shows us that in a well diversified investment, the declines have been temporary. Two, trying to time the market is just a fool's errand. You do risk missing the best performing days because the best and the worst trading days often happen really close together and occur irrespective of the overall market performance of the year. So it's effectively impossible to know when to get in and when to get back. We really need to be thinking about returns like one of those glass ketchup bottles. You know, it takes a while, but then often it comes out the same time. So quite as ever, it's about being intentional with your money and understanding what you want to achieve and for over how long. I obviously cannot tell you if it's right for you to invest or remain invested without giving you specific advice. I can, however, do as I've done, which is explain why this dynamic is not just normal, but to be expected. It all really boils down to what is going to happen with inflation. Thankfully, I've done a video where I unpack inflation expectations where you can find out what the research says about it coming down. You can catch that here. Either way, thank you so much for watching and I'll see you next time.